Hi everyone, Dr. Hall here, and we're going to finish out our unit on the reproductive system by talking about the final uh, part of the third lecture. We're going to focus on barrier methods of contraception. So barrier methods, right, we're going to place a physical barrier between the sperm and the oocyte. I just, there's so many good, funny things out there on the internet, right? So compare and save. Trojan condoms, $3.25. Huggies diapers, $22. It is amazing how expensive diapers are. All right. So when it comes to barrier methods, we basically have three main categories. There's the male or penile condom, the female or internal condom, and then the diaphragm. Of these three methods, the first one is the most user-friendly and the most commonly used. So that's the one that we're going to focus on because I want to make sure we go into it in sufficient depth. So we're not going to talk about the other two um, any further but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So male condoms, they cover the penis, right? It's, it's a latex or plastic sheath, basically, that then catches the ejaculate so that none of the semen and therefore no sperm can actually be released into the female reproductive tract, right? So if no semen is released into the vagina, it can't swim up through the cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes to find the oocyte. So there are three basic different materials that condoms are made out of. The first is latex, which is kind of the standard. It was the one of the original materials um, in modern times. Um, in ancient times, people used goat bladder and linen and all kinds of things. Um, and then our second category is the synthetics or plastics. And then finally, kind of lambskin, which is kind of a nod to ye olden days. So let's talk about these uh, in detail. So latex is, you know, made from the rubber tree. It's thin, it's really stretchy. And what's great about latex condoms is they protect against both pregnancy and ST STIs or sexually transmitted infections. The downside to latex are actually two. One is that some people can be sensitive or allergic to latex. It can cause some reactions or some rashes or some discomfort for them. Uh, the other is that latex, interestingly, is also a barrier against heat transfer. So if somebody is using a condom, it can feel a little cold. And so sometimes people don't like that. Um, so then enter the plastics or the synthetics. The first one on this scene was uh, polyurethane. So that was the first kind of latex-free condom. And uh, it works okay. It's not quite, it has a weird feel to it, I think. It's not quite as stretchy as latex, but there's a new synthetic called polyisoprene. It's the one that's in the skin brand condoms, and I think there are some others now as well, but you can look on the box and see actually what they're made out of. Um, and that tends to have a really nice feel to it. It's really stretchy. And the nice thing about the synthetics is they do allow for heat transfer, um, so they don't feel cold, uh, which is really nice. They also protect against both pregnancy and STIs, and of course, are good for anyone who's sensitive to latex. It's a great alternative. I think they're superior anyway, but um, so you can test it out for yourself and see. And then finally, there's kind of these lambskin condoms. They're not actually lambskin. They're made from animal gut. These are quite literally sausage casings. Like if you've ever bought these, you'll see they're it's very strange. It's just like what covers a brat. Um, just a little thicker. So they're often marketed as being kind of all natural and they do allow for heat transfer so they have kind of that more natural feel in terms of temperature but they're not stretchy. Um, they're, they're kind of strange and the really important thing that I want you to know is that they protect against pregnancy but because it's a natural membrane it has tiny pores in it. There's, they're small enough that sperm can't get through, but the bacteria and viruses that cause STIs can get through. So lambskin condoms do not protect you against STIs like gonorrhea or chlamydia or HIV. So um, I don't recommend lambskin condoms at all for anybody ever, unless um, you just really want to try it and you're in a committed monogamous relationship and you've been tested and you're negative. Um, they also tend to be really expensive, which is interesting. A little more difficult to source, right? So those are the three different materials available. 
So it's really important to use a condom properly. So there's a link here to a video from Planned Parenthood where they do an excellent job breaking it down. I'm gonna go on the next slide and I'm just gonna kind of read you the steps, but they do a much better job and they actually demonstrate it. So you're welcome to watch that instead of listening to me on the next slide. So you're gonna to need to wait until the penis is erect to put the condom on. You can't really roll down a condom on a flaccid or a non-erect penis. It's too soft and it doesn't work well. So you have to achieve the erection first. Then you're going to open the package, just tearing it with your fingers. Don't use your teeth or a knife or scissors because you might accidentally poke a hole in the condom with thus defeating the purpose. Then you have to take a look and figure out which way the condom unrolls. There's one way in which it will unroll smoothly and another way in which it won't at all. So you need to figure out kind of which is right side up. And then you wanna pinch the tip of the condom, the end of the condom. That's gonna save some space for the semen, for the ejaculate to go, and also prevent any air bubbles from being trapped inside. So it's gonna decrease your risk of breakage if you pinch the tip so you have that reservoir there. Then you hold, holding the tip, pinching the tip you unroll the condom down the length of the penis all the way to the base covering the entire shaft and so most condoms come with some lubricant on them already but you can always add a little drop of lubricant on the glands penis and um, that can really enhance sensitivity so if you're like oh I don't like condoms it doesn't feel good give that a try sometimes it can make a big difference uh, and really improve sensation you do not ever want to use two condoms at once. It might sound like a good idea, but the friction between the two condoms actually can increase the risk of breakage. So only use one condom. Then you'll proceed to have intercourse. And then after ejaculation, you wanna remove the penis from the vagina before the erection is completely lost. Because if you wait too long and most of the erection is lost, right, the penis gets smaller and then it, your risk of the condom slipping off is much higher. So you want to remove the penis from the vagina or the anus, wherever you're having sex, holding the base of the condom against the body so that it doesn't slip off. Then remove the condom, dispose of it someplace appropriate, and clean off the penis before any further genital contact. So there's your basic rules. So I mentioned lubricant. Let's talk about it a little bit more in depth. So most condoms have a little bit already because it improves sensation and reduces the likelihood of breakage by reducing friction. Additional lubricant can be used on the outside if needed, as we talked about. Vaginas naturally lubricate during arousal, but sometimes a lot and sometimes just a little. So sometimes you need a little extra. And as I mentioned, placing a little drop in on the inside before you put the condom on top uh, can sometimes greatly improve sensation. There's different types of lubricants out there. One of the most famous is KY Jelly. It's really cheap <laughs> um, and it works well for lots of people, which is great, but it also has a lot of interesting chemicals in it. And so it can be very irritating to some people. It also doesn't tend to last more than about five to 10 minutes, which can be enough for a lot of folks. Uh, but if you wanna kind of go a step up, you can go for the, um, Astroglide, which is a water-based lubricant with glycerin in it, or liquid silk. There's all kinds of lubricants out there. It's beyond the scope of this lecture. So moving on. So spermicide. So it's less frequent now that you'll find condoms with spermicide, but you'll see spermicides are also sold in the drugstore, often in the same aisle. And so on the surface, this sounds like a good idea. Let's add some spermicide to the condom to try to increase its effectiveness, right? And kill any sperm that might somehow slip out. But actually they've studied this and it is no more effective Effective than just a condom without spermicide. So it doesn't help at all. And actually, spermicide, because of the chemicals used in them, they can be very irritating to the mucous membranes in the reproductive tract. And because of that, there's evidence that they can increase your risk of actually getting STIs or getting infections by causing irritation and inflammation of those membranes and making them more vulnerable. So therefore, we do not recommend, if you're using condoms, we do not recommend that you also use spermicide. If you're not using condoms and you're not using any other form of birth control, please, by all means, if spermicide is the only thing you have at your disposal, please use it um, or abstain. But um, if you're already using condoms, we do not recommend adding spermicide. 
So if you use condoms correctly, they're actually very effective. So I mentioned this earlier, 98% for perfect use. So that's a 2% risk of pregnancy over one year. But what we find is that with typical use, right, they're only about 85% because most people aren't using them perfectly. So the question becomes, okay, what are the problems? Where is this where is this breaking down? So the two major problems that people run into in real life uh, that prevent them from being perfect users are breakage and slippage. So breakage is often due to either improper use, like not squeezing the tip to leave that reservoir for the semen to be ejaculated into, or improper handling. So things like latex, it's a natural substance. It can break down over time, especially if it's kept in hot places or places with a lot of friction. So if you're carrying it in your back pocket or in your wallet for a long time, or if it's in the glove compartment in your car, which gets super hot in the summer and super cold in the winter, that can um, really reduce the integrity of the material and increase your risk for breakage. We know that if you use condoms correctly, if you, if you handle them properly and you use them properly, breakage is actually very rare. And we know this, interestingly, because there are places in this country where prostitution is legal and so one famous brothel is the Mustang Ranch in Nevada. Interestingly, Las Vegas is not a place where prostitution is legal. You would think perhaps, but it is not. But other places in Nevada, it is. So Mustang Ranch is a brothel and they allowed some reproductive health specialists to actually live with them for a year and study them. And these people, these women and other people who work there, they are experts at using condoms and their condoms did not break, right? So they're really good at knowing how to use them. The other problem that can happen is slippage. So if the condom is too large, right? So it might kind of feel like an ego boost to buy the Magnum condoms or the super large condoms, but if they're too loose, that's a problem, right? Because then they can slip off and semen can spill into the vagina. And like I mentioned before, waiting too long to remove the penis if too much of the erection is lost the penis gets a lot smaller that also increases your risk for slippage so how do college students do at using condoms so this is data from the 2012 study of the National College Health Assessment. They survey over 40,000 college students um, every year. Actually, the data hasn't changed, so I haven't bothered to change the table. I've been telling students about this data for a long time. But so let's take a look at how often students um, report using condoms for vaginal sex specifically. And so we'll notice we've got two different colors here. Men are in the orange and women are in the kind of gold color. So um, more than 20% of, of male-bodied folks and a full 30% of female-bodied folks say they never use condoms. Now, this is of people who are having sex, right? So they are sexually active. You might say, oh, well, maybe they're mutually monogamous. They're each other's only ever partner, and they've been together for years. And yes, that may be true, but I've also been working in student health long enough to know that sometimes you think your partner is being monogamous and they actually aren't. Or sometimes you think that you are their first ever partner and you actually aren't. I've had a lot of uncomfortable conversations with people after they get diagnosed with chlamydia, for example, that perhaps things were not as they anticipated with their partner. Um, then some people rarely use them. Some people sometimes use them. Some people use them most of the time. <laughs> And then um, for always, right? So only slightly more than a third of college students report always using condoms. And this is one of the reasons why Student Health Services is always in the business of testing for and treating sexually transmitted infections like chlamydia, which is one of our most common ones, right? All it takes is once um, to get an infection. And some of these infections, you don't have any symptoms. And so you don't know that you have them. You feel totally fine. And yet, you can transmit them to partners. So I'm a huge advocate of condom use um, all the time and of getting tested regularly. So effectiveness, we've talked about this before. So I just want to point out to you that if you are using no form of birth control at all, you have an 85% chance here of getting pregnant in a year. This is, it's not 100% because not everybody is 
perfectly fertile, right? And it can take several months. So sometimes I meet people and and they're sexually active and I'll say, what are you using for birth control? And they'll say nothing. And I say, oh, are you hoping to get pregnant? And they'll say no. And then they'll say, but I haven't gotten pregnant yet. <laughs> And uh, it's often just a matter of time, right? So if you don't want to be pregnant or if your partner doesn't want to be pregnant, please use some form of contraception. But anyway, the point of this slide is to show you that the male condoms, right, if used perfectly, they can be pretty effective. But um, uh, typical use failure rate is about 15%, but that is still way, way, way better than using nothing at all. So just a reminder that um, using something is way better than using nothing. So overall, here is a table of the contraceptive efficacy, the effectiveness of the different methods that we have discussed in this lecture. Uh, so I've Absolutely, the get it and forget it methods, the implant and the IUDs are the most effective because there is no user error. The shot, you only need to remember once every three months. So again, typical use is closer to perfect use. With pill, patch, and ring, effectiveness falls off a little bit because it can be difficult to remember those things. And then condoms have the lowest typical use effectiveness because they're tricky, right? So um, hence me taking this time to go over proper usage with you. So in summary for this last lecture, we've talked about how childbirth is relatively difficult in humans compared to other animals because our big brains necessitate a big skull and therefore large head and our upright posture and walking on two feet requires a narrow pelvis. So that's a difficult combination. So three phases of childbirth, labor, regular uterine contractions of that myometrium, that smooth muscle middle layer of the uterus, pushes the fetal head against the cervix, which stretches and dilates the cervix. That stretching of the cervix sends nerve signals up to the hypothalamus, which then tells the pituitary to make oxytocin. Oxytocin then causes stronger uterine contractions. So a positive feedback loop with stronger and stronger contractions, increased dilation of the cervix until it's finally completely dilated. Then you can enter phase two of pushing or fetal expulsion, where the woman can voluntarily bear down and she's moving the fetus through the pelvis, that narrow spot in between her tailbone or her sacrum and the pubic symphysis, and, um, and then out through the vulva, usually the head and, and then followed by the shoulders are the largest parts. After the baby is born, we'll clamp the umbilical cord, and um, then shortly after the baby is born, the placenta will detach and be delivered as well. We talked about ways to not get pregnant, right? So contraception, we have combined hormonal contraception with estrogen and progestin, the pills, patch, and ring, highly effective if used perfectly. They have some risks, right? Blood clot, stroke, heart attack, which are very unlikely, but also benefits such as treatment of menstrual disorders and acne, as well as a reduced disc risk of ovarian and endometrial cancers. The progestin only methods are safer from a medical standpoint, but without the estrogen, you might get irregular or absent menstrual bleeding. Mini pills or progestin only pills are the lowest dose method, so you have to remember to take them every day at the exact same time. Depo-Provera shot is a higher dose method, so it does cause negative feedback on the hypothalamus. It's one shot every three months, highly effective. Can in the long term in some people cause decreased bone density. And then the implant, which is that rod placed in the arm, is good for three years. The most effective contraceptive available lasts for three years. We then talked about IUDs, which are also get it and forget it methods placed in the uterus in the office. They can last anywhere from three to 10 years, depending on the type. The types that have progestin in them cause decreased uterine bleeding, which can be excellent. And then the copper is also highly effective, but can in some people cause increased menstrual bleeding. So has the advantage of not having a hormone, but might increase periods. Barrier methods, condoms can be very highly effective if used correctly and consistently. They can't work if you're not using them. We talked about the three different materials out of which they are made, latex being kind of the old standard, the newer synthetic ones, of which I think polyisoprene is a great material, and then the lambskin ones, which do not protect against STIs, only protect against pregnancy. So overall, those get it and forget it methods, the IUDs and the implant are the most highly effective because there is no use 
user error. But if you are a perfect user, then pills and condoms can also be really good options. So that's it for the reproductive system. I look forward to your questions.